One is an objective critique of human society and paranoia of the 1950s. The other has Keanu Reeves in it, so that's pretty cool. The Day the Earth Stood Still, they remade it. Hi, and welcome back to another episode of They Remade It. I'm your host, Stuart. And I'm your host, Jacob. <laughs> having, a, having a bit of a, a, a character a character trait there this time around, or uh, doing a <laughs> no, character so bit just, this time? No, I was, I'm just feeling a little musical with it. Ah. You know, da, 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 da. I am your host, Stuart. That's very operatic. You sound like uh, Pavarotti. <laughs> I'll Pavarotti be Domingo. <laughs> A stumbling, fumbling Pavarotti. <laughs> that sounds about right. Which is he looks like now, he could bowl over. If I if I a new title for my autobiography: stumbling, fumbling Pavarotti. Stumbling, fumbling Pavarotti. You know what? That's I like that. I, you should keep it. I would check Encyclopedia Encyclopedia Dramatica first to make sure that's not already Pavarotti's entry there. I mean, and it, if it's not, then you're good to go. Hooray! But, you know, moving on from that, uh, given that I'm probably going to be a little light this time around on on movie features, I'm going to be talking about the news, but do you want to talk about your thing first? Yeah, what I've been watching. Okay, so, um, before that, I have I have some things I want to go back on real quick. Uh, for oh, yeah, sure. So, um, la- the last episode we did on The Nutty Professor, correct? It's been yeah. a little bit. Yes. Um, <laughs> I remember I because mine. A, I didn't do it last time, and B, I cannot remember the one before. So, Ah, perfect. Okay. So, um, last time was The Nutty Professor. I want to bring up two things. First of all, I had Marvin Kaplan listed in the, in the cast for the 1963 Jerry Lewis one. I just forgot to bring him up. He wasn't an important character or anything. Uh, he was, like, a, I think a member in Jerry Lewis's class or something. He was just one of the classmates. But I like Marvin Kaplan. I think he's funny. And he was the voice of Choo Choo in Top Cat. So I just wanted to bring him up because I feel like I, I brought up Hanna Bar- or I brought up Hanna Barbera when we talked about Howard Morris. So I feel like I need to bring up Hanna Barbera for Marvin Kaplan, too. Um, well, well, alrighty. <laughs> uh, and that aside, I do want to make it clear yes, I wasn't aware of it going in during recording, editing, or shipping. But there is a sequel to the Jerry Lewis Nutty Professor film. Um, I can tell it's recent because it's CGI. And I think it's called Son of Nutty Professor, the Nutty Professor 2, or something like that. It could just be called the Nutty Professor. But I know it's a sequel because Jerry Lewis reprises his role uh, in voice form, of course, and has, like, a son who apparently does the exact same thing that Jerry Lewis does in the first film. So it, it, it might as well just be the first film, but animated. But it's technically a sequel because Jerry Lewis's character has a kid now. That is horrendous. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about it someday. Uh, I mean, it, is it more than 15 years after the original? It's CGI. It's a CGI animated film, so it's post-1995. Oh, yeah. Damn. Well, shit. I figure it's probably mid-2000s is what it looks like from the box art I saw. Yeah, what fresh hell are we diving into now? <laughs> and it's a sequ- it's a, it's an overdue sequel that came out, like, after the Eddie Murphy one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what? Yeah, after the Eddie Murphy one and af- what is you know, this? after the film that Jerry Lewis produced that was a remake what is- of his film. What is this Arabras or- or- bullshit? This is disgusting is what this is. God, fucking hell. I don't even want to do the show anymore. <laughs> fucking can- cancel it. <laughs> Shut it down. Shut it all down, damn it. Okay, so uh, what I've been watching instead. <clears throat> yeah. I'm-, I'm very weak-willed. I decided to do the show anyways. Um, I mean, same. I-, I got nothing better to do. So I watched... 2019's Tolkien. Um, oh yeah, I meant to go see that, but then completely forgot about it. 
Yeah. Uh, it was all right. There, I didn't have a lot of, you know, there weren't any real issues with it. Um, in fact, I think it was better than what a lot of biopics are. Mm-hmm. Um, because a lot of them are way too on the nose. Like, w- one of my least favorite, I, I still haven't seen it, but I saw that clip and it made me vomit in my mouth. Of uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, when uh, Rami Malek as Freddie Mercury is coming up with Bohemian, uh, coming up with Bohemian Rhapsody at the piano, and he sings a lyric to it, and he like stops and he's breathing really heavy, and he like stares open. I I don't know, like stuff where he, they they plan it so that the audience is like, I know what that is. Oh my god, you know stuff like that. Yeah. And going into this, I was afraid that there was going to be a lot of that. Where it's like, he's a kid going to school and he has a dream about uh, Aragorn. I don't know. Uh, I thought or there like was going to be say, full or like, of stuff like that. Or they say some shit like, one does not simply walk into Germany. Yeah, yeah something really stupid. I thought yeah, where that it's that like, oh, that's where he got the line. Oh. But no, there was a lot of restraint in that. I'd say that maybe 5% of that movie is Hobbit, Lord of the Rings stuff. The majority of it literally is his life, his relationship. There's not a lot of war stuff. The The war is like at the climax of the film, but most of it is him at school and uh, bonding with the friends that he made and his first love. That's what most of it is. Hmm. And then... Uh, the I, not Lord of the Rings since that didn't come till after, but the Hobbit stuff, the five percent of Hobbit stuff comes in like the last fifteen minutes of the movie. So oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. they they showed a lot of restraint with that, and I'm very surprised. Unless there were like nods here and there that I didn't catch because I didn't read the Cimmerillion or whatever. So I'm sure it's like that could have those, been there. I'm sure it's like one of those things where they give like. Subtle nods saying, like, oh, maybe the, this event influenced this other thing later on, or that sort of thing. Yeah, I could totally see that. Just, you know, references to his larger t- works or the Bible that he wrote for that universe that I don't know because I didn't read. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It, they, it felt like they had a lot of restraint with that, so that was nice. Um, nice. Uh, other than that, that's the only, like, movie movie that I watched. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other two things that I saw were both of the, uh, Nickelodeon specials that premiered on Netflix. Uh, Oh, yeah, the Rocco's Modern Life and Invader Zim. Yes, both of those. Uh, they were, they were back to back. Uh, one was on Friday and then the other was the following Friday. Um. Nicktoon Renaissance. Yeah, it makes you wonder what they're going to do next. Uh, Angry Beavers, maybe? Ah, Real Monsters? Hmm? Or absolutely nothing. That seems like the trend with these kinds of things. Or or that. (laughs) I don't know. Both of these were actually fairly, I mean, not just successful, but good. So, I I don't know. Maybe they'll actually do more things with it because, yeah, I thought thought both of these were, were really good. Um... So I just touch a couple of points on these. Uh, for the Rocco special, Static Cling. Um, Rocco, I, I know I've said it before, but Rocco is my favorite Nicktoon. Uh, it mm-hmm. still is. I revisited not too long ago some episodes, and I still think it's the best Nicktoon. I think it holds up the best. Um, and, and and of course, it's, respon- it's directly responsible for Phineas and Ferb and SpongeBob, because neither of those show's creators would have been able to create it had they not worked on Rocco first. Yeah, it's uh, like that. It's the doom of uh, of you know Nicktoons and cartoons in general. It's like yeah, you, you worked on it. All right, here's your own show. It, 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 that's pretty much exactly the case, actually. Yeah. yeah. Or what people say with Flapjack, how it a lot of people that worked on Flapjack went on to do Gravity Falls and uh, um, regular show and stuff like that. Uh, adventure time hmm. so uh yeah flapjack rocco doom they're all in the same category <laughs> they're practically yeah. the same things the seed of a long tree of history yes um if i could i didn't i couldn't come up with an even more pretentious analogy than that so <laughs> i have to go back to norse mythology for it 
Oh god, yeah. Uh, it's, it'd be even worse because I'd know the actual name of the tree, but I'm actually not going to say it, so I can save myself. Yeah, don't give it up. Make that a Patreon exclusive. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Congrats. So here's our announcement. <laughs> no, um, we're not. We're not. We, we, we don't know what the fuck we'd offer. No, I, I have nothing to give but my a love. Firm, a firm handshake if you ever figure out who we are and come to meet us. Uh, but then I'd have to touch them. I don't want to do that. Don't want to touch the face. <laughs> a firm hand wave. Yes, I'll stare at you and wave awkwardly from, and then walk away. From a minimum five foot distance. <laughs> well, this is uh, tangential at best. Yes, yeah, but, continue. Um, My bad. No, I, I was involved as well. But, oh, I mean. uh, <laughs> for the Rocco one, uh, it's sort of the same thing with restraint. I'm glad that... Uh, the way the special's set up, it's 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 perfect for someone who loves the series to go and watch it. Because mm. I know it's an overused phrase at this point, but like a love letter to the show in a way, but it's also the universe of Rocco is so crazy that the references to the show to a new viewer, they don't stand out from all the other things that are happening. So the character that is just like a foot with a face on it, like it fits in with everything else wacky in the universe, so, like, a new viewer would be like, okay, that's just one of the characters, but he's a secondary character that made a couple appearances on the actual show, and they do a lot of stuff like that. Like, I I knew that the show would be acknowledging a lot of that within, I'd say, the first five to ten minutes, because uh, the the character from my favorite episode, which was a, a an environmental uh, musical, uh, he is a talking compost heap and he shows up and sings a little bit of the song uh, of his song from that episode right before he's smashed by a flying house. So they <laughs> do a lot of that with the special, and that's nice. It's like the modern equivalent of like getting a hook from the uh, offside of the stage. That I would say that's exactly what it was. It was like, remember this guy? Well, he could be dead now. <laughs> you haven't seen him for 25 years, and now he's gone. Yeah, um, that sounds like a lot of the crap in the, you know, finale for Samurai Jack. Oh, boy, yeah. Well, uh... <laughs> yeah, that shit sucked. Not a fan of that. Anyways. Yeah, no. Uh, it, it tackles It tackles a lot of really cool, cool modern-ish things, and it has important messages in it about change. I don't know, it's good. I mean, you know, it's Rocco's modern life. I know that's the point I've been making, but there's some people that don't like some of the avenues that it takes for various uh, right-winged reasons, I'll oh, say. No. Oh no, um, a cartoon from our childhood is doing some weird things. Who honestly gives a shit? I saw someone on Twitter complaining about that, like, they ruined my show by adding all this liberal nonsense. I was like, one of the episodes I remember the fondest because they played it in reruns on the Nicktoons Network constantly was uh, an episode called Closet Clown, which was just about in-the-closet homosexuality, but since they were on Nickelodeon, they, instead of being gay, it's about being a clown. Oh. <laughs> it's like a part-time job, and that was like a whole episode they did. Like, they did yeah, that stuff all like... the time, but since they were on Nickelodeon, they had to step around it a little bit more. It's like, motherfuckers, if you didn't notice that sort of shit happening in your shows back then, it's because you, A, just didn't understand it, or B, you're just dumb. It's like, I, that stuff happens yeah. all the time. Pretty much at this point. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, and, and I don't want to stay on it too long, so I'll keep going. Yeah, sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, the Invader Zim one, all that good stuff that I just said about the Rocco's Modern Life special, uh, I... I enjoyed the Invader Zim special a little bit more. Hmm. Um, it doesn't have quite the history that Rocco had for a number of reasons. All right. Uh, so it can't do nearly as much of that. But it is so, I don't know, adventurous and action-packed. And I know that the ep the show had episodes like that as well. Um, cause I, I mean, I watched it when it was airing and when it was in reruns. But, right. but it's so much more grand in this. It, it's an actual movie. Rocco felt like an extended episode, which I loved, but this felt like an actual movie for Invader Zim. Ooh. Uh, and I need the, to go try and watch it. 
and actually maybe try to go watch the original series because I was always turned off of it because my one friend was always like, oh my god, it's so funny, it's so random, lol. And I was like, I'm going to stab you with a spork. Yeah, that's still a problem, and they, I mean, that still I mean, exists like, I'm fine to with an it extent to it. in the special. Like, I'm okay with watching that. I'm not okay when people obsess over that. That's my problem. Oh, I know, and, and it's not the show's fault. I know that, too. But when you're watching something like the special, which this is a th- real thing from the special, I'm watching the special and there's a montage gag with Gurr, and something he has is like a gun that shoots out waffles and then syrup leaks onto him. It's not the show's fault, but I'm like, ugh, that is uh, that is such a, a hot topic I mean, that's Gurr what... thing is like a shirt with him shouting waffles on it. So, I mean, he did, you know, you can't start that think trend. About it. I, I know, like I said, it's not the show's fault, but, like, at yeah. this point, like, 15 years after the fact, you can't help but think about that instead of the show. It's like you go back um, watching, like, you know, old family videos, and you're just like, oh, so that's where that trauma began. Uh, you know what, that's exactly what it is. Some shows back are on it, it's like, easy to go back to. It's like, oh, that was foreshadowing. That was real-life foreshadowing. Yeah. Oh, but, God. Uh, um... As, as far as as far as that special goes, like I said, it's all of that and above. Uh, the artistry behind it is fantastic. Uh, after the, there's a little segment before the title sequence happens. Immediately after the title sequence, it's a long curved stretch of road with houses dotting it. Uh, Zim's neighborhood, basically, and the sky mm. is all pink and purple. And these are all like color palettes that were used on the show, but it's so much crisper and there's more shadows and shade because I feel like the budget was because that's one of the like five reasons that killed Invader Zim was it was too expensive, but it feels like the budget on this was even higher. Oh yeah. Like, like I still love all the stories about all the just goofs and gaffes they had on it just because of how, either badly funded it was or how much they were just like oh shit we forgot to add cars in this scene where there's a bunch of traffic noise yeah so the characters just scream at each other over nothing Zim! Uh, what? which is referenced in the movie for like oh, that's, 30 oh, that's seconds awesome. okay yeah no I gotta, I gotta watch it then um uh doctor membrane is great because he has a much bigger role in the movie than he ever did in the show uh, cool. He's he's actually a member of the plot, and Roger Bumpus, Squid, Squidward's voice actor, he still brings it. And hmm. since Squidward's an apathetic character, he's still funny, and he gets great screams. But I love his take on Professor Membrane just because he he has dramatic moments. He can be funny. He ha- he has a much wider range. I feel for a character mm. that never cries or is afraid, he has a much wider range of emotions. I know that's crazy to say. But you can have a limited range, but still a good one. Yeah. The one problem I have with it, and I know other people have brought it up, is Gaz in the film. I, I like her as a character. St- this is a really minor nitpicky complaint. Um, but Joan and Vasquez never saw the character of Gaz as a golf girl. But because of her demeanor and the way she dressed, the fan base took her as such. So in the comics, he changed her appearance slightly. Uh, and her mannerisms a bit, and that carried into the special, so she doesn't feel like an entirely different character, but she feels like she's evolved. And, again, there's nothing wrong with that. The one nitpicky downside to it is her eyes are open almost all the time, and it feels wrong for a character whose eyes were closed like Brock on Pokemon for 95% of the show. It's like, it, if, it's like if Mandy were actively smiling. Yeah, it's a very strange choice. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, that's nitpicky. And, and sometimes the animation's too fluid, but when you watch it, I'm sure you'll see it. it. I think because the budget, sometimes they went a little too crazy on shots with someone reacting to something, and it, I don't know, it looks like a Flash cartoon. Yeah. Uh, it, not Flash, because that's more stilted. I don't know, it looks like really, it looks too fluid. Like, there were extra frames inserted that yeah. detracts from the rest of the scene. I don't know, you'll see it. Okay. It's hard, it's hard for me to describe. I'll be sure to watch it then. All right, and that's my take on those three films. Uh, ten minutes of <laughs> that. I mean, eh, we, we've gone longer. <laughs> what's your news then? What do you have? Yeah, yeah, like one little thing just for the sake of it. If I don't end up watching a whole lot or anything at all, I'm going to just try to touch on some news articles. 
I'm not doing this in any kind of deliberate manner, but I will from this point on. I'm only doing this now because I realized, okay, there's like three specific news stories I at least want to bring up. The first one being, uh, you know, obviously at time of recording, that the whole most recent scuffle between Sony and Marvel, and that now Spider-Man is no longer part of the MCU again, or something. <laughs> so, like, what the hell is it with this franchise? I don't know. I, I, I did manage to read an article at some point today where it said that they weren't actually at odds. They were still technically in, in talks, but I don't know how valid that is. I don't know if they're yeah. actually still in discussion or if that's just a technicality to say, well, they have one more meeting. And it's like, well, they're pissed, so I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. I don't know. All right. I'm so just, maybe, just... maybe there's still a, a slim sliver of hope for that. <laughs> superhero. God, how many times do we have to kill Uncle Ben? That poor bastard. <laughs> this is gonna just put him right in the coffin every time. My God. That's but, unfortunate. I did see a post relating to that, though, that was like Spider-Man sulking in a window, or Peter Parker sulking in a window, so it was like uh, Peter Parker, when he realizes he's gonna have to watch Uncle Ben die a fourth time, and I was like, actually, he didn't watch him die in, oh, the, yeah. in the Tom Holland ones. They skipped all that. Yeah, well, that's well, which you know, fair enough. I guess you can count Spider Verse because they did have that scene of him walking into the abyss, but right. Ah well. I don't know but... if Peter saw that happen. Eh, who cares? <laughs> it's like whatever. But um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there was that. There was another one where I saw that the Matrix Four is apparently green to start production, and I'm like, why? Why? Who wanted this? Who actually wanted this? <laughs> like, The Matrix 3, like, was fine. I think people give it more shit than it really needs. Like, everyone goes like, oh, it's so CG'd and everything. It's like, man, it could look worse. But, like, it wrapped up. Like, I know there are theories that, like, there's a prevailing theory that there's actually, like, a second Matrix that everyone's actually already running around. Like, the people who think they're free are in themselves in another level of the Matrix. But, like, that's dumb. And, like, when you get to, like, an actual film level, if it's cool to have, like, a background theory to say, like, oh, their troubles aren't truly over. But to actually have another movie, I don't know what the fuck they could possibly do. I... I just... It's, like... Uh, why? Why good. do we have to keep making more remakes? I We're tired. Be, I think that'd be a good episode for this show because I'm really not a big fan of the Matrix, so that might be yeah. uh, interesting to look at and see what they do with it. I mean, I can't even say I'm a <laughs> big fan of the Matrix. I just think Keanu Reeves is decent, you know. And like the first one's okay, but like beyond that, I could never say it's like, oh man, I'm so big on it for it and everything. But it's like, otherwise, I'm just kind of like, yeah, it's a decent film. Yeah, that's fair. Wachowskis are good. That's that's pretty much all I got to say on the matter. Okay, they're sometimes good, excluding the, you know, like Juniper Ascending and everything. Oh, yeah. Well, we don't talk about Jupiter Ascending. Jupiter I said Juniper Ascending. Oh, it does. I heard Jupiter. It's fine. Yeah, who, who but gives yeah, a, none who of us honestly talk about gives a fuck. No one talks about... Mila Kunis doesn't talk about Jupiter Ascending. We can just leave it be. Uh, fair. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, that's... That's one little thing. I'm, uh, that's a little thing I'm kind of pissed about. Another, the third and final thing, which I'm more moderately pissed about, is uh, they recently released the title for the newest upcoming Bond film. It's <laughs> No Time to Die, which is, without a doubt, the dumbest Bond name ever. I, I can't <laughs> fathom why that's the title. Like... I know, have yes. any time to die. But, like, it's, like... And I know there's other contenders, like Octopussy or Diamonds Are Forever and that sort of shit. At least, like, those two <laughs> things describe shit happening in the film. Like, Octopussy, it's about a woman... It's about a woman named Octopussy, and there's an octopus involved somehow. Um, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've seen that one. Um, and then Diamonds Are Forever. Like, Diamonds are a huge, big, like, central plot point of everything. But, like... All the modern films have had, like, cool snappy titles that have at least meant something, with the exception of Quantum of Solace. That's a whole other bag. But that at least, like, still sounds cool. Kind of, yeah. 
I just I think my least favorite is Moonraker. I hate Moonraker's title. Yeah, that one's not great, but the, like at the very least, that but, one's. But kinda, still, yeah, I agree with it's, you. It's kind of mysterious sounding, at least. But a like a little bit, it sounds like he's gonna like set up a Green Acres farm on the moon. I guess. <laughs> I just I, I just I cannot fathom why, like I'm guessing it's because like you know the newest Bond has been revealed. Um, it's I miss something Lynch like Natasha Lynch I think, um, and so like my thought is that it's probably going to be, the situation where it's like they're actually going to confirm the whole thing of, oh the name James Bond is just a moniker held by multiple agents over the years, and like it's going to kill off like Daniel Craig. And, like, that's the most they can imagine it. But, like, if they're going to be doing something that's never been done before in a Bond film, they couldn't have come up with a cooler title than that. Also, because I know that Daniel Craig's going to be in it, because we saw as much online that was reported. But I think think if he does end up dying in the movie, you probably don't want to call the movie No Time to Die. Yeah. Because clearly, at least Daniel Craig does have time to die if he's going to do it. So at that point, you're a liar. I guess, like, maybe, like the most I can imagine it's like no time to die like saying like James Bond technically never dies like there's just a new one like that sort of thing that's Uh, like you know what if that's the case I actually might like the title but I'll have to see the movie first before I know if I like the title right right exactly and like I still I still think it's a silly fucking title it's just like you know it's 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 not even just that it's silly like Bond names Bond film names are silly that's a given but it's just it's kind of just lazy they literally were just like, you know, oh, let's just, let's do something kind of like the old days rather than, you know, keeping it a snappy title. It's like, you know, Casino Royale, cool. Like a, a cool, interesting name actually says location. Quantum of Solace, utter nonsense, but it sounds cool. Skyfall, sounds cool, and it's a location in the film. Spectre, again, sounds cool, and it's a major plot point. No time to die. Ugh. <laughs> I just, it's so just combination of both ridiculous and lazy it's yeah, just, yeah it's just it perfectly hits that sweet spot of eh and uh and also <laughs> with the exception of the letter o it's the exact same font as the love boat so you're welcome yeah you pointed that out on the group chat <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> maybe that may hey if that becomes a thing in the movie my god oh maybe gavin mcleod will be q <laughs> you know what? I'm excited for the movie now. I mean, same. I'm still excited <laughs> to see it. Like, I love Bond films, but yeah. But yeah, that's that's my two cents on the subject. I just uh, yeah, that's that because I have you not watched anything PC. else. I have just been griping about the news. You heard our movie news here for first, folks. Stuart Art. is the new Variety. Hooray! That is man. That is a new low for entertainment. If I'm the new Variety. <laughs> <laughs> just well, saying. the bar wasn't like, I, set that high. I'm okay. I mean, fair enough. Oh, but well. I suppose we should move on to the main event, one that I'm actually been very excited for. Uh, obviously, by the title, yes. <laughs> "The Day the Earth Stood Still." Something else with Keanu Reeves in it. Whoa! Yeah, it's just a whole. We're getting full circle early on this one. Directed by Robert Wise and written by Edmund H. North and based on the story by Harry Bates. Opening on the classic montage of shooting through space, the 1951 film leads us into a scrambling Earth as they observe a flying saucer touching down in Washington, D.C. From the ship comes the alien Klaatu, played by Michael Rennie, or Rini, I'm not really sure, who expresses he has peaceful intent. However, as he produces an unknown device from his suit, an on-guard soldier reacts and shoots him, wounding him in the shoulder. This causes Klaatu's robot, Gort, played by Locke Martin, to appear and destroy many of the soldiers' weapons and uh, cannons. You know, like, I guess, I, I didn't really know what to call them. They're like anti-aircraft guns, but I never really understood that. It's like, it's already landed. I don't know. It's like, just, let's just be safe. 
However, Klaatu orders him to stand, stand down as he is still okay. He is then taken to be hospitalized. After which, Klaatu, addressing a member of the U.S. government, uh, states that he must address the entirety of the human race as part of his mission. He is, however, told this is impossible due to the political climate of the day. In response, Klaatu escapes from the hospital in order to interact with human humanity directly in order to judge their quality of character rather than, o than only address men of power. This sets off a countrywide manhunt for him, so he disguises himself as an ordinary human being and hides within the city. He does so by renting out a room in a shared house and converses with some of its residents. Among them are Helen Benson, played by Patricia Neal, and her son Bobby, played by Billy Gray. Klaatu spends most of his time with Bobby as Helen goes out to work and dates with her boss, Tom Stevens, played by Hugh Marlowe. On these outings, Klaatu laments on human society, such as their need for great war graveyards, their often hostile reactions to things they don't understand, and their overall sense of paranoia. Eventually, Klaatu's, des Klaatu's desire to speak with a quote-unquote great man spurs Bobby to suggest they go to speak to one Dr. Jacob Bernhardt, played by Sam Jaffa a local leading scientist. While the doctor isn't home, Klaatu sneaks into his building and completes a complex physics problem on his chalkboard in order to get his attention. Barnhart later calls on him in order to talk face to face. Klaatu reveals to him that his mission in regards to the future safety of the human race and must address all of it in order to explain the situation completely. Together, Klaatu and Barnhart devise a meeting of humanity's brightest minds from all fields of science and society and culture, etc., etc. To illustrate the severity of the situation, Klaatu causes a worldwide shutdown of electricity in order to show his race's destructive power. With the aid of Helen, he tries to make it to the meeting, but is shot and killed by, so uh, by soldiers out looking for him. He tells Kellen, go to Gort and t tell him the command, Klaatu Barada Nikto, the famous phrase, in response to him being killed. She does so, and Gort goes out to retrieve Klaatu's body and actually revives him on the flying saucer, where just outside the meeting is beginning to take place. He exits the spaceship, now donned in his original suit once more, and addresses the crowd, stating that he has come from a race of advanced aliens that possess autonomous peacekeeping robots just like Gort. He states that humanity may join them, but only if they cease their violent tendencies and, and their pursuit of atomic nuclear power. After speaking, he returns to his ship and leaves Earth in order to let them contemplate their fate and hope for a better future. Moving right along to 2008, it is directed by Scott Derrickson and written by David Scarpa and Edmund H. North again. So I didn't really figure out why, in a, or I should say how he was involved. I'm guessing they just kind of took notes from the original script. So, whatever. Or he might have been directly involved. I don't know. I can double check later. While the 2008 film has a similar setup and moral, it has a much more aggressive and dark tone in it to its events. Notably, notably among these changes, Helen Benson, now played by Jennifer Connelly, is actually now a direct a doctor of astrobiology, making her much more innately involved in the action. She assists Klaatu, Keanu, now played by Keanu Reeves, in his escape and remains with him for the majority of the film. However, Klaatu is much more ambivalent to the people of Earth in this version, claiming his mission is to save the Earth from humanity rather than to save humanity itself, as he and his race believe that they are hopeless to, sa to save themselves and that they must save the Earth, which is too precious for fostering life. They are obstructed along the way by one Secretary Jackson, played by Kathy Bates, a confidant and main hand of the President, and by Helen's own adopted son, Jacob, played by Jaden Smith. Over the course of the film, Klaatu begins to see the potential of change in humanity, notably by his interaction with Dr. Barnhart, now played by John Cleese, who is now a mentor to Helen. In such a meeting, he claims that humanity and all the greatest evolutions have happened at, the point of at a point of a precipice, just before it's threatened with destruction. Klaatu even mentions that his own race had a similar situation. This revelation, however, come, almost comes too late, as Klaatu's robot, Gort, now played by just a, a CG robot, so no actor on that one. Um, he, the, Klaatu's robot, Gort, has begun the process of destroying humanity in the form of an all-consuming swarm of bioengineered insects. In the end, Klaatu braves the swarm to reach his ship 
and stopped the destruction, sacrificing himself in the process. This action, however, comes with a price, and as such, all electricity across the entire planet, planet is permanently shut down, making way for humanity to change their ways in a much grander sense. And that's your lot. That's a bit of a bit of a tonal shift on the on these ones, but you know, it's still pretty cool on both ends. Yeah, I I have to agree. I was surprised. I I, I mean, we'll get into it a bit more later. I understand that, but I was kind of surprised how the two thousand and eight one ended because I wasn't I wasn't expecting it to be that different I mm -hmm. should say uh, from the 51 one but again we'll we'll get into discussing that when we talk about the endings instead I think it's about time I do some full circle Okay, first things first, we have, uh, uh, well, I guess first things first for what I should say is that we don't have any for 1951's The Day the Earth Stood Still. Uh, oh. Hmm. I don't know. We got, like, Michael Rennie in the cast. We have Francis Bavier from Andy Griffith's show. I, I feel like we would have encountered some of these people before already, but apparently not, at least not from what I found. Um, yeah. Well, go figure. I mean, I know well, we have at least one for the 2008. Oh, yeah, we have five. Exactly. Ooh. Um, so, starting this off, we have James Hong, who played Mr. Wu in The Day the Earth Stood Still, and he plays Hannibal Chu in 1982's Blade Runner. Ooh, oh, fantastic. yeah. Fantastic. I meant to add him in my um, lineup, but I just I, I think I just kind of gotten... I tend to match up the characters, at least the number of characters between the two, if they're relatively similar. But Right. This but time around, I forgot exist. about that one. He didn't exist in the 51 version, so it's hard to... Yeah, true. It's hard to match him up to anything. But yes, James yeah, that's Hong. That's a good point. Also known as, known as Noodle Duck in Kung Fu Panda. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, secondly, probably the most obvious one at this point is Jaden Smith, who played Jacob Benson in The Day the Earth Stood Still, and was Dre Parker in The Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio's replacement. Ooh, fucking Ray. Hoo, hooray indeed man uh, i've got some words <laughs> to say about that but that will come later oh good because i do too i was hoping i wouldn't be alone on that <clears throat> okay thank god <laughs> uh next we're halfway there uh john cleese was professor barnhart in the day the earth stood still and was the narrator in 2011's winnie the pooh oh yeah <clears throat> next apologies for my pronunciation we have Sergei Howde? Huda? Oh my god, I hate myself. Um, who played scientist number one in The Day the Earth Stood Still, 2008. I have to admit, I don't know what the distinction is between... Because in 2008, they have millions of scientists, okay? So I don't know how he could be scientist number one. I don't know which scientist that is. Um, he, he's probably like one of the guys who like says something in the uh, like briefing or something. Maybe, or may, maybe one of the guys that sh uh, that uh, Helen talks to on the carrier before they take off. Maybe. Um, but yeah, scientist number one in the day the Earth stood still, and he was Bofris <laughs> Bofris <laughs> in 1997's The Jackal. I'm sorry, I. I didn't have a problem with this when I wrote it down, but just looking over it again, I'm like, this guy, everything about him is impossible to announce. His name, yeah. his roles, I don't I don't know what they are. It, it well, looks In one French, case, it didn't even have a name. But... Yeah, exactly. Just, I guess that was easy, though. Um, I mean, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, lastly, J.C. McKenzie played Grossman in 2008's The Day the Earth Stood Still, and, get ready for this, was... The realtor, the realtor, in 2006 is The Departed. I don't uh, know what I, that is. I I, 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 I think I might remember that. It's like the guy who showed, um, Matt Damon's character the apartment that he was at that he gets killed in. Oh, good. You know what? That's probably it. I was like, I don't remember a realtor. It's been almost a year since we watched this one. Um, but yeah, that's all I have 
put down for full circle. So, I take it you want me to start this time? Yes, I do need a mild break on the vocal cords. <clears throat> okay. So, spoiler alert, if it wasn't clear enough already, I was familiar with the 1951 version, but I had not seen either of these going into this, which I feel I made clear uh, based on yeah. what I said up to this point. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I'm not sure which of these I enjoy more. I'm kind of leaning more towards the 51 version. I'm, again, we'll get into all the specifics of it, but the, yeah. um, the 1951 version has, has a story and a message... Uh, it, it, the setup and the through line feel very Twilight Zoney, where yeah, there's a specific the, the, moral. Yeah, that's the feeling I was getting from it. I was trying to trying to place it while I was watching through. It's like, what have what have I seen this setup before from? I was like, oh yeah, I just, it just needs Rod Serling. <laughs> yeah, what picture if you will, a man yeah. named Kletu. But um. I guess one of the most prevalent things that I got in my mind from this was uh, an episode of the Twilight Zone called Peep, uh, The Monster on Ma Monsters Are Due on Maple Street, I think is what it was called. And it's essentially like the electricity goes out in this town and everyone's freaking out and they all start oh, pointing yeah. fingers and attacking one another like, it's your fault, you did it, because there's one house across the street that has power. It's like, why do you have power? You caused the outage. And then at the mm. end, spoilers for, like, a 60-year-old episode of The Twilight Zone, but it's aliens that cut the power to find out how humans would react to something like that happening. It's like, yeah, they're vicious, they attack each other. And that's that's essentially what this movie is. And oh, yeah. And, like, I, I should say, I've actually, see, A, seen that episode, and B, in, I think, seventh grade English class, we were required as a reading thing for Siri, like a like a few uh, members of the class were meant to each play each of the characters, just reading off from the like the written version of the episode. Oh, and I awesome. and I and my buddy um, played um, the two aliens at the end. That's awesome. I wish we had re read screenplays for old shows in any yeah. of my classes. We had done that one, and then we had also done another episode of it. Well, actually, it started off as a short story that became an episode just from a contest it was um an incident at something or other bridge it's this whole thing oh, where Owl creek bridge yes 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 That's yes like awesome we're, episode yeah guy's getting executed and he thinks he escapes but in reality it's just a fantasy right before he actually gets executed it's like oh my god <laughs> guys dark as hell. i love the twilight zone <laughs> um but yeah so that's sort of the feeling i got and the 2008 one doesn't uh, doesn't disappoint me in the slightest. I enjoyed it for what it was. Um, mm -hmm. Very sci-fi-esque. It gave me action movie feels, even though there wasn't a lot of action. You know, just a lot of frantic running around and, like, the clocks ticking type things, especially near the end. Right. It was, um, it was, uh, it was thrilling. Was point. Like, it actually had a yeah, decent yeah. amount of thrill to it. Sci-fi thriller would be the perfect way to describe it, yes. Mm -hmm. um, though, I, I, I just... The way, just the way it ended to, it sort of turned me off because it felt so abrupt. But I, I get the point behind it. Yeah. So, you, it felt a little weirdly paced throughout. Like, it just like how like it ranged with how everything interacted. Like for, like, for one thing, one thing that I didn't mention in my synopsis is that now Klaatu has like superpowers and like can like control electronic devices and stuff. Or like stuff that like, which is kind of weird considering one of the things he controls is a car at one point. That's not technically electric. It's <laughs> it's like I understand the concept, but still, it's like I he, I don't know how he could propel it with just the power of electricity. Yeah, if it's, we're gonna get, if we're gonna get pedantic in 1951, the the whole point of the title, "The Day the Earth Stood Still," is a demonstration that Klaatu does where he stalls the Earth for 30 minutes. To yeah. sort of get everyone to pay attention to, to the severity of the situation. So he does that by stopping all electricity. And that also freezes all the cars on the roads. And I was like, well, I mean... That I at least understood from, like... Technically... I, like, I guess from the idea that they had car batteries at that point. Like, they probably... I, I imagine it also, like, stops spark plugs or something. 
but yeah. Right. I right. That's sort of like I guess that makes more sense when you consider the electrical components, but when you take the car as a whole, like the first thing you think of isn't necessarily electric well, maybe now it is. But the first thing you think right. of is like combustion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like gasoline. I don't know. Um I, I, yeah, I there love is the... some electricity. I'll give I'll give them that. Also, I just gotta say, I love that with our engineering backgrounds, that our immediate first thing we go to is, why the fuck are there are they doing this stuff with like cars, but it's electricity? Ugh. <laughs> it's, I like. There's so many other points to talk about, like just the fact of, you know, how different the fifty one is compared to a lot of older films we've done. It's like, no, the spark plugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna put that out there. If I get any of my engineering facts wrong, don't worry. I had a background four years on computers, so. Yeah. Maybe I'm not the first person to ask about cars. Yeah, and I um, you have more background with it than I do. So, I, I had a background in architecture. <laughs> you built a car or two. I mean, you architected I built, a car. I mean, I could build a house that looks like one. <laughs> I can make a car out of rebar. Yeah. <laughs> Stop, that's a load-bearing tire. Anyway. <laughs> Oh man, that one got me. Anyway, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But uh, but yeah, so I, I do see what you mean. It's like how it, like the like I just to go back on the point I was starting to make. The pacing really does feel all over the place because there are moments where Klaatu seems kind of godly and unstoppable with his powers, but then something has to happen where things get separated, or there has to be another very human moment in order to convince him to change his mind with everything. It's just, it kind of feels all over the place, at least with that. But at the very least, it is still more active than the 51 one. Like, the, I, and I should say, I adored the 51 one. And I, I, should, and I should also say, um, since you had mentioned it at the beginning, I have seen the 2008 one before. I've seen it a, a few times, I think, because it was on, you know, just revolving on HBO for a long time. So I was like, <laughs> all right, this is on right now. It's better than nothing. It wasn't a TNT special. Right. Um... And so I've, I'm at least aware of that one. But then the 51 version, I still have some history with it. I had, um, my grandma actually had talked to me about it for a little while and actually got me a little old little tin wind-up toy of Gort, which I've tried to find in order to have a picture for the social media, but it, it's come up short. Um, oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah. But, yeah, so I had actually watched the very beginning of the 1951 one, but I didn't get that far i think i'd gotten to the point where he escapes from the hospital and but at that point i just had to leave or we just stopped watching it for whatever reason and it was kind of bittersweet getting to watch it all the way through and really enjoying it because you know my grandma's passed on for a while now and it's just like oh i wish i'd finished it now <laughs> and so it's yeah it was kind of sad but i was like you know what yeah this is a great movie grandma thank you that was so, a, that's a nice point of connection there though you'll always remember that when you think of plot to yeah it's just such a cool little thing but yeah i, I should say uh, it was of a uh, gort not claw i don't know why i said uh claw to um no no you said gort oh, i did I, okay sorry yeah i just said claw because i was just pulling something from the film but you said gort. Ah. Okay, i figured cool. that makes sorry. sense because he's the android or yes, robot yes, yes. so but yeah that was um and so you know i went into this with at least some background to it and i gotta say i really really enjoy the 51 one again i it is kind of a toss-up at least at the moment between the two which one i like more but it's just it, even just compared to a lot of the older films we've done it breaks a lot of the mold like it doesn't feel as static and every character is the exact damn same like there's even a scene that i love that inadvertently kind of pokes fun at that where um Klaatu first arrives at the shared house and the lady asks him, you're not from around here, are you? And he's like, uh, how do you know that? And she says, oh, please, I can spot a New England accent from a mile away. And I was like, oh, my God. It's like every other protagonist in every other film we've done. They all sound the damn same. It's like a New England accent. <laughs> and now it's actually, like, in a joking manner because he's an alien. <laughs> yeah. That's, and I, I just had a, I had a deep little, little chuckle about that one. I, I really enjoyed it. That's pure. That's perfection. Yeah, and, and so I just, I really, I just, I loved just the feel of the fifty-one one. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe it. 
Yeah, and I and I know we're going to talk about themes and uh, the different acting choices, different characters. I know we're going to get into all of that, and I don't want to jump the gun, but a lot of my internal like, registering, I guess, or c- comparing of these two films, a lot of it is boiling down to how they how they handle their climax and their ending, in my mind. Uh, yeah. It, it's just hard for me to look... It, it, uh, basically, the 2008 one is like as soon as Klaatu reaches his peak of understanding, that's when it ends. So I understand like the build up to that moment because that's the entire purpose of Helen's character is like to convince him that the Earth is worth saving. Um, right. And John Cleese's character, I guess, but to a lesser extent, which I'll also talk about later. Um, yeah. But but yeah, it it is so abrupt. It's hard for me to. I mean, like. The 51 one isn't terribly, it isn't exactly, you know, slow with its ending either. It does kind of, like, it does have a much more distinct climax, but at the same time, it really does just kind of go, he is saved, he is brought back to life, they've waxed philosophical about life and death. Here's a quick speech, don't fuck this shit up, see ya. <laughs> and so, like, at least in that regard, it's sort of similar, but I definitely do see what you mean. It's... I, I guess it was it does, easier for me to... Sorry? Oh, no, you go on. I was just going to make it quick. Oh. I, get, I guess the 51 one was quick. I guess it was easier for me to digest, though, because there was dialogue, perhaps. Yeah. So it was easier to follow. Character motivations were on the line. He got to give his speech, which was his driving force of the whole time, is like, I want to speak to all the world leaders. Which yeah. is sort of duplicated in the 2008 one, but it's given up fairly quickly, which is sort of where the film takes its first major diversion. Um, right. Well, but, I don't know about that. The whole uh, world is ending asteroid thing was a big diversion, but... Okay, yeah. Like, that one... I did. I did, I definitely think... Distinctly, I do like the opening of the 2008 one much better. Because, like, it shows a modern reaction to, like, what the hell is happening and, you know how the world would actually actively react. Whereas the opening of the first one, it's kind of like, oh, we're getting reports of this flying saucer, and like everyone's just chilling out on the lawn before it lands. They're like, oh my god, let's <laughs> run! Versus, like, in reality, in the 1950s, I imagine, oh, there's a giant ship flying straight towards us from the east where our enemy of, like, our giant enemy of the USSR is. Panic. <laughs> like, that's... Like, sheer panic. Like, the 1950s were just as prone to that as the modern age. Not just, like, you know, just because we have the internet just th- doesn't mean we're all just like, oh, my God, we're so sensitive now. It's like, no, sh- people did that shit all the time. Oh, no, yeah. We, we saw that in <clears throat> M, uh, in both versions of M, and they were only, like, two decades apart. What? Yeah. And like, it does not take much for people to just start rioting and form a mob. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and plus, you know, sci-fi and everything and the idea of War of the Worlds had already existed at this point. It's like, people would have panicked. Yeah. People people knew. They knew. Yeah. And at least with the 2008 one, they set it up with, oh, there's literally zero chance of us getting people out in time, so informing them would be useless. So that's kind of cool. So it's just being like, okay, we're just stressed as hell right now. So yeah. it actually does, you know, it kind of just sets up, it's like, oh my god, maybe, like, some actual shit's gonna go down right at the beginning and it just kind of pulls up it's like oh no that's the actual ship (laughs) which gotta say awesome ship design Hmm. just it just like how they just kind of went they just kind of went like balls to the wall with hey let's make these guys so freaking advanced it really is like the adage um i cannot remember who who said this quote but it's like you know sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic that sort of thing where it's like Okay, yeah, no, cool. Let's let's go all to the wall with this. This is an extremely advanced civilization. I'm more familiar with the much more blunt magic is unexplained science. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, it took me a second to realize what you're talking about because this whole time you've been talking about the 2008 one, but for some reason you said spaceship and I thought of the 51 version. I was like, eh, it wasn't oh, yeah. really that special. I mean, the way it moved, like the Star Trek-esque, they have people moving those pla I mean, that was cool. But its design was pretty standard oh, yeah. for a UFO. But yeah, oh, yeah. I love it's, the big it's... glowing ball. Oh yeah, it's like a storm in a globe or something. It's awesome. Which I thought yeah. was, which I thought was really cool because you know it really does play up the idea that 
this alien race is are essentially just extreme conservationists and so even their ships and their technology emulate nature and so it's like oh okay that's pretty cool oh def- yeah definitely there's a lot of mystique to them and they they put more i feel like in the 2008 one they put more importance on the fact that uh, it's an alien like you were saying there's definitely more reaction to it like how it would be it's like we don't understand these things um it, it, like in that meeting with uh kathy bates's character and the other like head scientists and generals she's like they have access to our satellite they know like everything about us and we know nothing about them and that's yeah. horrifying yeah this is like we have never been this caught with our pants down in history <laughs> And then they, of course, they the the balls start leaving the planet uh, Earth a little bit later, because the destruction's going to take place. And one of the oh, generals yeah. is is like, maybe we scared them off. And Kathy Bates is like, they're not scared of us. Just yeah. matter of factly, like, you'd be stupid to think that. I mean, yeah, honestly, like they... we haven't really done anything. Yeah, we've done nothing to threaten them in the slightest. We we shot the guy, I guess. Yeah, but like, and it's just. And I do, and I, and it's just like every time I go back through the whole movie, and I do love those bits. I do love how real it is with the situation, and how much it more focuses on the human reaction to this. But the more and more I go back through it, the more and more I'm just like, this really is kind of missing out on the original point that um, the fifty one was trying to bring across. Like, it's not just the fact that it's like you know it's much darker compared to the fifty one one, but it's that you know we're able to see at least at that time it would have been a contemporary objective look of what society's become like it literally had to take an alien from another planet wandering out around like a fish out of water to understand oh we're an incredibly paranoid society that reacts to every new thing with extreme violence like literally the first thing that they do to the guy is when he pulls out anything remotely different they shoot him and so it's like oh that's a very real reaction and it's like oh many of us would probably have done the exact same thing and that's awful (laughs) it's yeah that we you know it's awful that we have entire specially dedicated graveyards for the war dead it's awful that we have all these people lamenting like claiming to be these great men who really just want to cause more violence and paranoia and it's like yeah that's kind of an incredible objective thing to see it's like you don't really see a whole lot of you know straight up chastising of society like which okay we there is that to a degree with the ones we've seen like scarface and that sort of stuff where it says like oh organized crime and that sort of thing but this one it literally just went all out like no everyone's an asshole <laughs> it's like where every person of every country regardless of affiliation or friendship or allyship or whatever the hell we're being dicks right now we need to chill i like the way that's framed too where Klaatu like straight up says blow yourselves up and shoot each other i don't care i'm not responsible for how you govern planets but you shoot a rocket like into space and we're gonna have a problem you're you're all getting blown up yeah like i i love the way that's framed where it's like yeah i don't have jurisdiction here but and keep I yourselves self-contained if you're gonna slaughter yourselves make sure it's just yourselves yeah it's like and like and that that's another big departure from the you know, from the 2008 one, where it's distinctly, essentially, Earth is their back garden, like the alien's back garden or something, because they, like, he they, they does famously say, it's like, this is not your planet. Um, and so essentially, it claims to have ownership over it and therefore has the right to just wipe out this entire species <laughs> versus, you know, 51 Klaatu being very a very lowly emissary in a way he's just being like i just i need to tell you about this because we have an entire subspecies of autonomous robots essentially that will blow you the hell up and yeah we know that you are capable of fighting that so chill the hell out and let us live too otherwise we'll blow you to hell and and, and just for... just to save the trouble and for the 2008 one i feel they lose that a bit because well, uh, oh my god, where was I going with this? Um, it, like you said, it all revolves around the Earth itself. Not necessarily the people on it or the civilization of humans, but more so like 
the earth is dying and I I hate this I really do hate this defense because it's primarily used by climate change deniers. Mm-hmm. Um and and they'll always their their first defense to climate change is like we are not affecting the planet in that way. This is natural. The the planet goes through all of this, uh it, it adapts, blah blah blah. While I do hate that primarily because of the way it's used, to an extent it is true. I don't feel like the aliens would really need to do... I mean, it's awful because we, the what we're doing is also affecting other species, but it's not going to destroy the planet because it will still be here and it'll just change. And so the aliens' motivations seem off. Maybe I'm thinking about it too much, going into it with that sort of knowledge or idea on things. It's like the aliens wiping out wiping out humans isn't to keep the planet alive, it's to keep it the way that it is, I guess. Right. And, like, and I do think, it's like... It's a little muddled. You, I mean, you are on to something with that one. Like, I think they're trying to establish that there's a more high and mighty mindset among the, you know, like, among the alien races. Like, you know, just the fact that, A, they're essentially they're essentially acting as colonizers saying like we have ownership on this land despite the native peoples here um and so and it literally ta- and it literally takes one of these guys being convinced of it otherwise before he can actually stop all this from happening and so i definitely do think you're on the right track with it saying like oh they're just doing it because they don't like this situation and that they're all themselves kind of paranoid about being like oh we have to allow life to foster on this planet it's like without giving this chance of this other civilization to do it despite them in their eyes probably being barbaristic yeah which i hmm, i think that's a good message for them to go after or a good angle it's not really a message um right but it, it, it is a good angle to have the aliens portrayed that way i think they lose it a bit too if you take into account the character of mr Wu who yeah. it's established through uh, Klaatu meeting with him at that McDonald's, great product placement. Um, that yeah, there's, he... a, there's a few big cases of product placement. <laughs> they're, at this, they're at this thing, there's like, oh, like someone puts on their watch and directly aims it towards camera. It's like, oh my God, shut the fuck up with this. <laughs> <laughs> World of Warcraft, which, yeah. which, which by the way, um, he's playing it, Jaden Smith's character is playing World of Warcraft and he's doing perfectly fine. Mom comes in and two seconds two seconds later he's dead. He was either in a raid that he was not prepared for or he was already about to die and he's just taking it out on his stepmother. Which I guess what wouldn't a... be out of character. Yeah. Um, but again, I feel like that's something we're going to get to. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anyways, back to Mr. Wu. Um, yes, yes it is. It's a bit strange because he's the one that gives Klaatu the report because he was sent back so many years and he's lived there for, what, 70 to 80 years, somewhere around there? Yeah, uh, I think he said, like, 70 years. But he's lived that long among the people and he's seen how they are. He's like, they won't change, they're barbaric, they kill each other for really minor reasons. So the whole planet needs to be blown up, which, okay, that would be in line with, like, the alien what what they're all thinking, right? Or what the aliens supposedly are thinking because they're this high and mighty. The lore that we wrote for this movie. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes. But then he decides to stay, even though he knows he'll die, and he's like, but I love them. And at that point, it gets a little confused, I think. And there's heart there. I understand why, because they give him an explanation. He's like, there's also another side to them. But right. he's not the one to explore it. Yeah, he's just like, well, yeah, there's another side to them, but uh, blow the whole planet up and I'll just sit here. Man, I would have loved to watch his story, honestly. See him living out his life with humans and seeing like a 70 year journey to go from high and mighty alien to I'm actually one of them now. I would love a boyhood style movie with Mr. Wu living amongst the people of planet Earth. (laughs) That'd be amazing. Now he's in the 60s. (laughs) <laughs> Shagadelic. Wait, that's oh the 70s. Um, uh, well, well, whatever. <laughs> who cares, baby? Yeah. But I guess it, I guess it, like, that, that's a minor segue, but it's a, it's a good segue for me to talk about. It's like, I do actually 
like while the tonal shift is kind of a bummer, I do actually like that it feels more natural for you know the state of the earth now versus the state of the earth then because you know 1951 that was cold war era but that was early cold war era that was long before shit really hit the fan and so it makes sense like oh there's still this pervasive hope about technology and atomic weaponry still being kind of on the a bit of the back burner but you know then along come the 60s and the 70s 69 especially and it's just like everything just escalates to 12 and so seeing actually <laughs> it react appropriately in the 2008 one being like look we've watched you guys for a while and you've long since passed this tipping point just just no <laughs> it's like we've seen you guys do some ridiculous stuff we're done <laughs> and so it's like okay yeah it would have been annoying if they still had the same like i do like i i definitely wouldn't have liked it nearly as much if they had the same kind of more hopeful outlook on things which like sounds kind of dark but at the same time it's like you know it's meant to address a modern planet that is itself going through a lot of shit so i do like that that they actually made it contemporary in the actual in an actual appropriate sense rather than contemporary just being like oh we have modern technology now Ooh, like in like like the jackal <laughs> like it's oh it's contemporary <laughs> that means we have like super technology and stuff it's like no shut up <laughs> that mean we have giant missile launchers that we can just blow jack black up with yeah we have like we just can just get around the country like it's no bother just with all this extra fucking ordinance <laughs> Versus, like, having to see an entire process of how a guy gets a fake ID in the original. It's like, oh, no, it's like, <laughs> let's, yeah. do a re let's do that one again. Yeah, let's, let's do it again, <laughs> just for fun. Never mind, I, that, never mind. I don't want to rewatch the Bruce Willis one. Um, That's a good point. Let's just, let's just gush about the original again. <laughs> um, so, here's the... Yeah, I, I'm lost because I know what I'm saying... But also, I keep doubling back on it because there's things that I like in the 2008 one that directly run in line with other things I don't like about the 2008 one. Like, I like Mr. Wu, and I like his character's heart, and I'd love to see a movie just about him. But then when it comes to his motives in relation to the rest of the plot and what we've built around what this universe must be, I hate it, and I wish he wasn't in the movie. Yeah, it just makes it muddled. Because it's, like, it's just trying to open up that dialogue of oh there's a chance of change things aren't necessarily doomed yet it's like that could have been done in different ways i would have it really didn't seem like klaatu had that much of an observable arc like i know it's meant to be like by the end he's like he genuinely believes humanity can change but it's like i don't know whether that's just keanu reeves or just how they wrote his character in general you can't really see it it's like you don't really see him change that much it's just he kind of just has slightly different attitudes with how he goes about things like it right till the end right near the end he's still like killing people that gets in his way with less you know regard for it than he does earlier in the film um it's just it's just kind of just kind of odd like it they're trying to do this whole like surrogate father thing with him and uh jaden smith's character and it really just doesn't work like at all <laughs> yeah, so it's, it, it's unfortunate because I do like I do like Keanu Reeves, and a lot of people oh yeah love him now. That I I wish he, I wish people would give it a rest with that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's definitely true. Keanu Reeves has even come out and said he finds it creepy, but um, yeah, I I do like him, but I don't like him in this because he he plays such a deadpan character and i think deadpan characters can be done well i think they're especially good in comedy for obvious reasons but when you have a character that's supposed to have an arc in a movie especially where they grow to know or understand something like he's learning from these priv primitive people that they have a right to another chance to you know like john cleese says it's on the precipice of annihilation that people will will change because they're motivated to do it you know, he, he, like, learns, he has an understanding, he comes to understand Jaden's character's problems and his missing his father and all that. But his facial expressions, like, rarely change. It's still that deadpan, and I don't know if that was a choice or if the director wanted it, but I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. Like, a lot of the... A lot of the, the saving grace of the... 2008 one really did kind of come down to its visual and really just kind of its conceptual 
bits, just like, you know, expanding on the universe of this, um, the idea of like how the, their technology, how this alien species technology works and that sort of thing. Gort is fucking kick ass in this one. I honestly love it. Um, just like how straight up powerful and like 28 feet tall of a monolith of a robot he is. Super cool. But it's like, once you get to your the human elements, it really starts to break down a bit. Like, I think uh, Jennifer Connelly is, um, as um, Dr. Benson, she was great. I think she was a great protagonist. Um, Jennifer Connelly is great, and Kathy Bates, I think, is amazing. Oh, yeah, Kathy Bates. She but, was definitely awesome. But that's not saying um, a whole lot, because I don't think I've seen Kathy Bates in anything I didn't like her in. So, I mean, fair. She is, she, she's just a straight-up good actress. I mean, yes. her and Jennifer, Jennifer Connelly, honestly. But it's just, like, beyond that, like, the supporting cast was, like, okay. Um, There's, like, the one, like, colonel character that's, like, facilitating, trying to attack Gort and that sort of stuff. He just kind of seems over the top. Um, That just kind of, like, weirdly over the top in this situation where it's, like, all these other people are very deadpan, very realistic reactions and everything, but he's doing stuff like, all right, let's arm your sidewinder missiles, and that's in the whole, like, sound like a goddamn, like, like carnival barker or some shit Gee, it's looks really like funny. he's gonna bust a blood vessel like like he was yeah. ripped out of a stephen king direct tv movie yeah yeah that's a great way to put it yeah it's just like i like that actor i've seen him in a couple just random things but it just it, he just felt so out of place it's just yeah, like and plus just the the scenes of them trying to attack gort in general like i'm sure was just trying to establish how powerful he is but at the same time they also just kind of felt shoehorned in so it's like all right whatever Right. Well, they they felt that they had to build up to the annihilation sequence, where right, it's like right, right. they're we're, they're they're attacking it, they're attacking it, they can't attack it, and it's like okay, we got to study it. So mm-hmm. they capture him and take him to the th- you know they they didn't need all of this exposition as to why he's at the facility when this when he initiates doomsday mode, but they did it anyways. And yeah. it was probably to fill time because they're. I would say that's like fifteen minutes of the movie, probably. I think it's mainly. I think it was to set up so that they could do the annihilation thing, but it wasn't right next to the ship where they had to get to in the first place. That way, there's actually like some a, amount of time they have to get to the ship before everything ends. Good point. He yeah, he couldn't just be standing there. I mean, especially because then, like, yeah, he is at their exit, so they'd still have that time to worry about but they'd be going directly into the fray i guess right which that would have been cool like them finding a way to go through the giant swarm like maybe they get to hijack one of the other smaller ships that land on the planet like that'd be kind of cool yeah (coughs) they do like a will smith independence day thing right (laughs) i could see that yeah 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 but speaking of which i feel like we should get to the slight elephant in the room because like oh, i want to talk about i want to talk about i want to talk about this and then i want to then go into talking about the actors in the 51 version because i think they're stellar but i cannot hold in my anger any longer about motherfucking jaden smith and every goddamn movie he's in <laughs> i gotta be honest i didn't even make the will smith jaden smith connection until just now like i mean i knew they were related that's not what i'm saying but the fact that i just referenced will smith i didn't pick up on that all right, I mean, yeah. pure coincidence. <laughs> that was a I, happy accident. I mean, yeah, fair enough. But yeah, it's just like, I, I don't know how you feel about the guy. I gotta say, I genuinely think he is like between this and a few of his other movies and the one we we have seen, he is one of the worst actors on the planet. <laughs> I don't know if that's just because of his characters that have been written, but every single character he ever plays is some immensely stupid kid. Like between this. And Karate Kid, and there was this other movie that was really, really bad. It, like, start him and his dad. They were, like, on this... They, like, go back to Earth, but it's, like, a bunch of... I was about to talk of... about After Earth, yeah. After I Earth, like that's that. it. Yeah, it's just, like, every single thing he's in, he's this petulant asshole who's, like, getting into, like, a bunch of trouble and, like, has to, like, kind of grow out of it. And this one, it is so prevalent throughout it, though. Like, more than anything else. Because so much of, like, their the ending action is spurred on by like him calling the military to come get the alien and everything, which like, first of all, 
kid calls government agency in order to come take the alien is a sentence that should never be ever stated because that's the stupidest shit I've ever heard. Ask any kid on the planet, hey, if you met an alien, would you want to hang out with it? Hell yeah! That's the answer. Every time. It is not, nah, I'm going to be a fucking narc. <laughs> I'm going to be the bad guy in E.T., well, fuck? also, do you th- well also do you think like how many calls during a crisis everyone's worried and up in arms? Kids are still stupid kids. How many calls do you think the government got from kids during that time that were like, "I saw the alien," or "I want to see an alien," or "I drew a picture of an alien"? How many calls do you think the government got from like kids? Like that's stupid that a kid yeah. would call the government and they're like, "We got to get to that cabin now." Like, yeah, and this is and this is the same government that has been somehow unable to catch this, you know, this fugitive and woman driving him around, even after they've identified his fucking her fucking car, and like know where she's going. They even after they were, they were closing in on her again, they couldn't find her as she drove off to John Cleese's house. It's like, fucking see, really? One, they are very inept. Two, yeah. I, uh, uh, the only way I can see the Jaden thing working in that instance is maybe if he, like, told them his name and they're like, wait, Benson? As in Helen Benson? Da, 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 and then they go there. That's the only thing that I can think of to make yeah. that work. Unless the, the military is literally sending planes out to every single call. We, we, yeah, we have a pretty big military, but we don't have that amount of resources to, like, go visit every schmuck that calls calls in. Oh, absolutely. I just and it's just like, it's that, like that's my biggest complaint is just being like, what kind of fucking narc ass kid is this? That's like, oh, his immediate reaction when the alien shows up is we should fight and kill them. It's like, okay, first of all, <laughs> therapy, please. Second of all, what did his dad fucking teach him that like brainwashed him to being like, oh, everything that's foreign and different, even if it's a straight up awesome alien, kill it. <laughs> it's like. I f- I think it's that like was it, supposed to be a revelation towards Jaden's character, I think, because since the beginning of the movie, you keep hearing about his dad in the war, primarily from him, and it's like, oh, his dad fought in the war, he lost his life, and then it's revealed by Helen's character that he was an engineer, you know, he worked in the sciences like she did, and he went over there. So, right. I, I guess he thinks that just because, you know, army tough shoot things and he's a kid, I guess that's the point. Yes, it's just it's still just I don't know, and it's just like, and like and I'll I'll try not to go out about it much longer, but like there's just so many different things about his character. It's like it's that, and then like how fucking back and forth he is about his attitude towards Klaatu. Like he witnesses him make two helicopters crash into each other, killing like five or six different U.S. soldiers, and then runs off from him, and then as he's running away from him sort of starts to trip off this little bridge um like maybe off of a six foot rise into water and Klaatu grabs his shirt (laughs) to save him and that's the thing that makes him be like oh he is good it's like what the fuck kid (laughs) a really shallow river (laughs) yeah like all the shit that you've been through and that's what does it like, and then he then goes on to be like, oh, I can take you here. It's like, you brought that one cop that you, you know, killed. That he, You brought him back to life after really quick. I'm going to go take you to my decayed dad's corpse. You can heal him, right? Can't you? Why can't you heal him? I hate you. It's like, you dumb motherfucking kid. Bobby would never have been this, said something as stupid as this. A bright kid just being like, oh, I figure out, I basically figured out he's an alien all on my own. I followed him. I was brave. I was curious and bright and was able to see through his bullshit and everything. No. Just, just no. <laughs> you dumb bastard. And, and I know how they baked it into the plot. I'm not so blind as that I can't see it. Klaatu realizes, like, oh, humans can care for one another. They can care by the connection between Jaden and Jennifer Connelly, whatever. I get that that's there, and that's the reason it serves. But why, 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 in 2008, are we having another story about a kid that does not like their step-parent? Why? Why? It's so overdone. I cringed. Yeah. 
when I like, when it first happened when he was in that room and he was calling her Helen because like they didn't even have to say it. I was like, oh, this is a story about a kid and his stepmother. Great. I don't know if the dad's dead yeah. or not yet, but oh wait, the razor yeah, thing. Like, okay, well he's dead. They, they made it so obvious, and it's been done to death. Like, yeah, that one was a that was just cringeworthy at this point. It's it it's just like oh my god, shut the fuck up. Meanwhile, you know, <clears throat> Helen Benson and Bobby Benson in the Fifty One one having a genuinely good relationship, and it's just like it feels so leagues beneath this. Like all the care, I love love all the characters in the 51 one because they actually feel real like even the, yeah, the even the like dad. the like, yeah even like the i can't remember his name um the the tom stevens character like the who is a secretary or something he seemed genuinely like he was he ended up becoming a bad guy and revealing you know where klaatu is and getting the military to attack him but it's like that seems like a genuine reaction that he was doing it's like dude like i figured it out this guy's an alien, and he's running around just right next to the woman that I love. And her son, yeah, I'm going to call on them. And, like, yeah, I'll get famous in the process, but that's a bonus. Why not? I, I got diamonds from the guy. Like, what Yeah, the? It's just, it was, which, uh, that was also another little detail that I loved. Because he's like, oh, it was like, you use diamonds as currency? It's like, well, yeah, they'll never wear out, and they're really easy to carry around. And I was like, that, on a planet where diamonds are probably really common, that's actually a really cool concept i never yeah, thought about he, that he, he exchanges it for two dollars which is just him being nice on his part it's not that he doesn't understand the value of currency it it doesn't matter what amount bobby would have given him it's like that's not his money like he doesn't he uses diamonds he just said it's just paper to him right he'll yeah, probably eat like, it like what does he care yeah, exactly so yeah it's like there's just so many different little elements throughout the 51 one that just like had very had a very real feeling to it you know we went to go see, you know, like Bobby talked about. It's like, oh, you know, my dad's off out here. We went to go visit my dad out in Arlington. And he was like, oh, my God, this is, this is actually sad. But he was very mature about it, just being like, you know, let's go visit this. Let's go do all these various things. It's like, man, that's really sad and really human moment. But, like, you know, this kid just keeps on trucking it. It's like, yeah, good on you. I, I, I love, I love, I should say, like, obviously, I love Billy Gray as bobby in this i think he was the highlight of the film for me because mm-hmm. he, he like he drove he actually actively drove the plot and not just because oh he stumbles into some facility and needs to get saved it's like no he actively you know my my favorite thing i saw about it was because it was just a subtle scene is you know Klatu comes in asking hey do you have a flashlight the lights in my room aren't working oh sure here you go and then he goes out to go talk to him again and then in the hallway sees the light from his own room being flicked off like from Klaatu's room being flicked off and with no dialogue and no being like oh he was lying like literally outwardly said he completely figures it out and starts to tail him all the way back to his ship and figures the whole thing out it's like wow that was a really cool just character moment between these two yeah I, like, I thought he was good I mean especially compared to what we got in the remake he was oh yeah like low bar he was pretty good out. I liked him <laughs> yeah uh, but yeah and just, like, him and Helen, even in that one, I, sh- I, I shouldn't, like, you know, I like Helen more in the 2008 one, mostly just because she's made an actual protagonist, but Helen in the original was really good, too. She was actually actively doing shit. Like, she saved Klaatu's life in the end. Oh, exactly, yeah. she. I mean, she's the genesis for that. Like, that's where the famous phrase comes from, is that scene he tells her to say Klaatu Barada Nikto, and uh, yeah. I put a role on that R for no reason. But, um, and she yeah, does not? it. She's the reason that he lives. Yeah. So like, that's a very important role. Yeah. And she's like, it, it was uh, the, the one moment of bad acting that I will need to mention is like when she first interacts with Gort and she just kind of like panics and faints to the ground. Classic, like damsel in distress style. I'm like, all right, come on, lady. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then Gort you, forbidden planets are onto the ship. Like, yeah. yeah, we've seen this. It's like, it's just interesting and everything. And I thought, I, I gotta say, when I first was going into this for some reason in my mind i thought i knew the ending that um klaatu ends up being killed but isn't revived and instead the command that she gives gort means that she takes him aboard i mean he takes her aboard um the saucer and then flies away with her to go talk to the aliens directly or something like that and i was like oh this is very different than i was expecting i'm actually very okay with this i'm i'm very 
I'm I did not expect him getting revived like that. It was a genuine shock. I was like, oh my god, yeah. that's awesome. That'd be a very different movie if there was a scene with her and like a high council of aliens. Oh, right. <laughs> I think like in my mind, I thought like they wouldn't end up showing that. It would just show her flying away, and that would be it. And I was like, like kind of like kind of you know leaving open ended, kind of the birds style. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah. All right, I see that. Um, I'd like also like to, I know I teased her earlier, but. It's, it's kind of a Kathy Bates style thing, just not nearly as important, but I really like Mrs. I like Frances Bavier's role in the 51 one. Oh, yeah. Just because she's sort of that uptight, very extremely living like at that, head of, uh, that Like hostel. head of the house. Sorry? Like head of the house kind of thing. Oh, yeah, like sort of that head of the house, like style role i love that line where they're sitting at the table talking about the alien like the night after or the morning after kalatu shows up and she's like i don't think they're aliens i think they came from earth uh if you know what i mean i was like oh yeah this is prime time for oh yeah comments I love that like line. that <laughs> exactly that, and that's what i loved about it so much it's like I the comments like the... saying this yeah like the the you know the dialogue and everything felt very genuine compared to a lot of very fluffed dialogue we've dealt with in the past. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah that's a legit comment. <laughs> Go on, you. <laughs> I mean, it's probably, you know, toned down a little bit. I'm sure they threw in a, you know, a bit of expletives back then. I mean, you know, what was the old saying? It's like soldiers from soldiers in World War II used fuck like a comma. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant, like, some slurs, which is what I was... Oh, I mean, I'm sure they had those too, but I don't want to say any slurs, so... <laughs> Yeah, I I, uh, I can understand why. Um, and uh, someone else I don't want to leave out. I do like him as a character, and that's um, uh, uh, oh my god, why am I blanking? Uh, Sam Jaffe as Professor oh, Barnhart yeah. in the fifty one version. I think he, I think he does a delightful job, and I really like John Cleese, but they gave him like nothing to do, it, which is very unfortunate. Professor Barnhart plays a much larger role in the 51 version because the plot is sort of... It, it, he is pertinent to the plot of this meeting of great minds and leaders. Yeah, Whereas, like, like, his, like his interaction is what sets off the third act. Yeah, but John Cleese, but John Cleese's role, the way they wrote it, he just sort of puts the bug in Klaatu's ear like, hey, we can change because uh, this is the time when civilizations need to change and then yeah. and then the rest of the story it's about Klaatu's arc because he didn't really have an arc in 51 because he didn't have to have an arc i mean he learns things he understands things and he he talks to the people but there's no arc he just has a goal which is yeah. a bad thing yeah uh, it's like and that's and that's it the movie wasn't really trying to do much more it was trying to just again it was giving like the audience an avatar to project and like to project hey this is how ridiculous society actually looks <laughs> yeah yeah very twilight zone-esque yeah you don't see I... a lot of character growth on a lot of those episodes because there's no need to unless there's a character that's like a shitty person that learns a lesson and then that's the moral there there's not character growth it's just a twist that gives them gives a message and that's like what this film sort of sets out to do and i think does well yeah, it was really cool. I, it's just yeah, it's and it, it was funny. I was trying to read up on the trivia on both these movies was pretty lackluster. But the one thing I did see that was really just funny, just seeing how many times it was brought up, is like all the people on set talking about like, oh, like it was said like, oh, we're you know we're so sad that shooting has has wrapped with John Cleese. He's so funny, he's so interesting. They talked about like, you know, John Cleese really wanted to do this role because he's like, I'm you know I'm an older age. I want to do a slightly more serious role, but I also don't want to be the same kind of manic scientist type, so I'm going to have a bit of an edge of humor. And like, and I was reading over that, and I was like, he was on screen for maybe four minutes. <laughs> I like, wonder if there's a bunch of stuff that was cut. I mean, like, that's well, all I can imagine, because, like, just the way they talked about it and everything, and just how interesting of a character he actually is for those like, those few short minutes... I think I gotta hope that there's some other cut content. Like, maybe after the fact, like, after they, you know, tr probably raid his house looking for them. <laughs> I gotta think that either there's cut content or John Cleese. John Cleese is one of the bigger names in this film. I mean, Keanu Reeves, Jennifer Connelly, 
uh, Kathy Bates. But John Cleese is one of the bigger names, so maybe he he was so expensive to get that they didn't film a lot with him. I don't know. I feel like it could be either of those. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I imagine it's a combo of both. <laughs> Quite possible. They didn't want to have him in the finale because that's just, that's just too much screen time. Right. It's like, it's oh my god. It's like, it's like there's a stipulation in his contract. Like once it passed ten minutes, you have to hit like a certain payment level. You're like, okay, we're good. Oh god, it's like all our budget's going towards the orbs. We can't do this. Yeah. Way too I mean, expensive. Yeah. It's like you know, Keanu Reeves is actually pretty cheap. He did it for even less money. He's that cool. But Jesus Christ. Can we get a different member of the Flying Circus, or, or maybe <laughs> just one of the kids in the hall? Like, something cheaper than this? Is the guy who played Arthur still alive? Has he still got the alcohol problem? <laughs> <laughs> He's got a liver problem. It's hilarious. Uh, poor guy. <laughs> what about the guy who played the fire sorcerer? Oh shit, that's the same guy! <laughs> Dudley Moore played a fire sorcerer? No, no, the no. Uh, John Cleese played um, the Tim guy. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, it's like it's like oh yeah, let's get him. <laughs> Wait, shit! <laughs> they had such a little, uh, such a low budget on that movie. I forgot. Oh man, their sound effects were just were just coconuts. We can't use that. Yeah, nope. Son of a bitch! We got we got to make it cool. What if the coconuts looked like storms? <laughs> <laughs> what if there was a cephalopod creeping out of one of the coconuts? Whoa. And Kathy Bates thought it was the alien, and she shot it. What if when they kill the it's bunny, a it's scene. What if when they they attack the bunny, it like it starts shedding off its skin like a bio like a bioengineered spacesuit? Oh, that's disgusting. This movie is canceled. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. I wasn't a big fan of that either. To be honest, it felt a little strange. Like the peeling yeah. off of the peeling the gray matter off, and then it's the Keanu Reeves body uh-huh. underneath it. Like I think we could have gotten it without seeing that part at least. But I did, I did like the idea of a you know the biological spacesuit and everything. I was like, oh, okay, this actually makes sense. Okay, to a degree. <laughs> it, it, they didn't, they weren't <clears throat> too grotesque with it, but there were some echoes of like body horror in that scene where it's just like peeling off and it's all gooey. Yeah. Almost like his chest was going to split open a la uh, the thing and, like, devour the doctor. Yeah. Yeah, that would that have been a different movie. Wouldn't have Maybe said no to it, it, I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, just really turn it up to 15 on that one. Um, yeah, uh, to be honest, I don't, I don't have many other points on this. I mean, I... I've I've hit the bulk of it. Literally, one of my points is um, J- Jaden Smith sucks, and then in brackets, commence tirade. <laughs> I'm glad that your note. I'm glad that you have specific bullet points of things to hit. Yeah, like I have. <laughs> Minor- I have specific. Like, I, t- I tend to try to have specific talking points, and I've I've run through definitely the vast majority of them, and the other ones are just kind of like minor. And it's just like. Oh my god. <laughs> the way my notes work is I literally when I'm watching the movies, I'll write down bullet points that are like stream of consciousness thought and then I'll either when I'm talking to you, I'll either turn them into things to talk about or I'll just make us like asides in reference to them just so I can keep for it. Like literally one of my bullet points here is so does Kathy Bates not know what a squid looks like or and then question mark. <laughs> like I that's just sort of what I do. Uh oh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> Uh, oh well. Yeah, can head cannon accepted. But uh, yeah, that I think that's pretty much everything that I have listed here. Um, yeah, I mean that kind of comes down to the big decision, I'm guessing. The big decision is that I enjoyed the 2008 one for what it was, and I given the other action movies we've covered, which I don't know, Total Recall was sort of thrip. I shouldn't say action, but Total Recall was sort of that thriller sci-fi. Uh, I mm-hmm. can't think of much others. I guess the Jackal has bits of thriller in it. Regardless, I, I think that uh, I enjoyed Blade this Runner, one much over. Blade, um, Blade Runner 2045 was pretty thriller. And even uh, the original. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the original w- had more mystery to it. I would definitely say that this is more similar or 2008's Day the Earth Stood Still is more similar to Blade Runner 2049 than it is the original Blade Runner. 
Oh, absolutely. I, either way, I think that the, I think that I definitely enjoyed this this one over all of those, but for the reasons I've stated here, I I do enjoy the fifty one version more because on whole I like the actors more. I mm-hmm. uh, I like the point of it. It's very Twilight Zone esque, which we've said countless times, and I've made it clear on this show that I love the Twilight Zone and everything that it stands yep. for. So I think Obviously the decision. Same. Yeah, but I think the decision on my end is fairly obvious. I think the one thing that 2008 really has a leg up on is uh, designs. Not even not even effects, because obviously over time those get better. But just the design of things is really well done and interesting. Mm-hmm. As opposed to 51, which they sort of kept it standard, I guess, so as not to confuse people, maybe. It's like, well... It's an alien. They got a spacesuit. Here's a standard robot, um, and the flying saucer looks like a flying saucer. What are you gonna do? If uh, anything, it, it almost it almost seems like they kind of subvert expectations. Like typically, you know, flying saucers of the day were were you know enemies, and they would shoot lasers out and that sort of thing. But it's like, oh no, it's a good guy. <laughs> well, they do cool. subvert expectations <clears throat> with uh, with the guy himself. Uh, I, I mean, just more so the design of things. Like if they if they made oh, like a weird yeah. ball that a man crawled out of, I wonder what audiences would have thought in fifty one. They would have been like, I don't care what he says, he is not a good. He just reptilianed out of the bottom of that thing. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. It, it sounds like a it sounds like something like a like a British TV movie would do. It's like they did weird stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, I could I could see that too. Which I actually think was a thing. I think there's a show called The Prisoner. I don't know. I, I need to oh, go look you know that what? one up. No, the, pri- the pr- you're right. The prisoner had balls that uh, uh, acted as a defense for people that tried to escape the island. And I hate that I know what you're referencing and can reference it back. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, whatever. <laughs> I, I, have no th- I have no knowledge of it. I just know that that exists. <laughs> well, it's a boring show, so there's Which, a reason actually, people don't talk about it. And that actually brings up a mindset that I did want to bring up just really quick i didn't have a bullet point for it but um one thing that i actually really really liked it is like i said it establishes in the 1951 one and even in the 2008 one that the robots like gorts activate in the presence of aggression and violence and that their entire species is like watched over by these you know uh sort like autonomous robots and everything and i the more i thought about it the more i was like I can't tell if I think that's an incredible idea or, like, a totalitarian nightmare whenever you think about it. Because, like, you know, that concept's been brought up from more often than not, than not the robots being the bad guys. And then I did more digging in it, and I briefly saw that the um, writer of the original story, the name of the story, I can't remember, um, but uh, Harry Bates, that had written the original story that the movie was based on, actually says that there's a cut line at the very end where the robot addresses the people and says, you don't understand. I am the master. And it was like, what? That makes a cool new light on this. And I I just, I saw that and I was like, my God, that would make such a much more interesting twist at the end. Yeah. (laughs) Which they couldn't have done that in the 2000. (laughs) They couldn't have done that in the 2008 one, but like, because they don't, don't really address it that much, but like, I just, I loved the, just that, just reading that alone made me appreciate the 51 one even more, because it's like, it doesn't, it even states in it, we're not perfect, our, our civil, our collection of civilizations, we're still working on it, and then it also opens up the idea of, even this idealistic thing might not be idealistic at all, it might be a complete ploy. Right, and, and even without this knowledge that you're bringing to the table right now, which is fantastic, that is something that I had considered when watching it, is... The whole idea behind Gort and these other robots is to prevent violence. But he right. himself, Klaatu himself, says that the punishment for inciting violence is unspeakable or it's too awful to imagine. And I remember thinking when he said that, like, that that feels like an avenue to take where someone would shoot back. Like, that sounds like just as bad as what we're doing. How is that not violent? How is a robot right. shooting you with a beam and making you nothing not violent? Right. And like, I, guess I guess because it's someone controlling you, it's fine. I guess, and, because like, and that's where the whole argument comes into it with it. It's like, if we get right down to it, they're not sentient themselves. They just have an automatic response that can 
presumably perfectly understand, yes, this is a violent action and we must stop it from happening. And, like, it's just, it opens up this whole dialogue of, is this truly good or not? And I absolutely love that. And I think that really, whenever I think back on that, that's really the thing that tips me over, that I I really do love the 51 one more, just because of how much it kind of, it, it think, I think it does more with explaining less. It just, it has these genuine character moments, and then opens up this idea of this other civilization and how humanity can change and makes it established this is in no way even on the protagonist side is not a black and white situation all the way through it's shades of gray with the earth and with the aliens it's like holy shit this is a really complex story that i was not expecting I, I, that's I, even more twilight zone than it already was exactly i adore it it's just it's almost like when when was this Twilight Zone prevalent? Was that in the forties or in later after this movie would have come out? Because like after Wonder... the movie came out, it was like mid. Fi- I believe it was mid fifties into early sixties. Well, it was only yeah. four seasons, so maybe just mid to late fifties. So I'm starting to think that the Twilight Zone was like this, because <laughs> this is kick yeah, ass. Yeah. I, yeah, I just I every time I think more on it, like every it's it's the opposite reaction on both. Anytime I think more on the 2008 one, I find more things to gripe about, mostly relating to Jaden Smith. And then the more I think about the 51 one, the more I find reasons to love it. So, yeah, I, yeah. I got to say, the 51 one knocked it out of the park. It's it's uh, like it's probably one of my top three movies we've done on the show. Oh, wow, that's a pretty high. I, I, I'd have to go back through and evaluate them. I know the Day of the Jackals up there. Maybe that's a list for some time. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, and I, I, I don't know why. I like, I questioned it so much going through this because I was like, you know, I've seen the two thousand one eight, the two thousand eight one so many times, um, and just like, I tend to like just like stuff visually more often. Whenever it's like, oh, it's doing cool stuff with effects and that sort of thing. But then the more I thought about it, I was like, no, this is. I like the more contemplative version of this. It's like the difference between Jackal and the Day of the Jackal. Yeah. One sets out to be its own thing, and the other, I think, relies too heavily on tropes is probably the best way to break it down. Probably, yeah. Uh, which, it's it's easier to set a precedence the earlier you come, so that is automatically yeah. unfortunate. But, I mean, we still get things made today that break the mold, so it's not impossible. Just try oh, harder. Yeah. I mean, hell, even 2008 kind of tried to break the mold in its own ways. I mean, I haven't seen, you know, alien designs like that outside of, like, like the weird ending of AI. <laughs> well, we don't talk about the weird ending of AI. Yeah, a, that never happened. Go away. <laughs> we don't talk about AI. We don't talk about Robin Williams in AI. We don't talk about Kubrick's and Spielberg's deal there. So, who the fuck is Robin Williams? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? What oh, wait, the fuck I know is him. happening? He was, he was who are Popeye. You? <laughs> <laughs> he did Popeye. Um uh. Yeah, you know, you know, it's near the end of the recording session when we start getting to this territory. <laughs> um, uh. and one last, one last great point for 1951's version is that uh, the design of Gort is prevalent still today and has influenced a lot of things in media as well as the rest of the movie. Uh, it's even, I think, this isn't a fact I read. This is just something I picked up on that I never realized. But I'm pretty sure that Gort was like a direct inspiration for the design of Starman in earthbound because you know, they're that... both just these tall these tall gray men from space with like a, a like a black line where their eyes should be and i don't know i think they're the same oh you know i i can definitely see it it definitely seems like it inspired a lot of just the aesthetic of early science not necessarily pulp but like just just you know sci-fi automatons in general like this was like I was reading through the trivia and just, like, various things people had said. This is, like, one of the earliest cases of it being, like, you know, this is an alien's robotic companion who will absolutely wreck your shit if it detects violence. It's like, that's a pretty common thing when you think about it. And it's it seems like this was one of the earliest examples of it. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, a common trope today, too. Not just with, like, a robot that does that, but a man that's either intelligent or a peacemaker and they have like this large hulking gorilla-esque bodyguard yeah that'll just like protect them at every corner i'm I'm sure there were probably one or two instances before before this but it 
whenever you have a duo, there's a bunch of different car- caricatures that you can go to, or archetypes, I guess is the better word, and that's definitely right. one of them. It's like Timon and Pumbaa. <laughs> which whichever which one's which you decide. <laughs> I don't know which one's Timon and which one's Pumba at like at all. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, just um, fifty one. So it knocked it out of the park. I like that one. We're in agreement then. <laughs> Hooray! Another agreement one. Yes. I I kind of I thought kind of thought going into this one like it definitely kind of did come down to at least personal debates, but I kind of figured this one is like the closest we'll come to it. But I had a feeling we were both gonna agree. <laughs> It's been a while since I think we've disagreed. I'd have to go back. I know we have in the past. It's just, it's been a while. Yeah. we got to get another person on here that just has wildly different opinions to us, and then we'll just be like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> a third member, huh? Bring in a oh. third person. Oh, God. Pinky and the bring... Brain and Larry. <laughs> I can bring in my girlfriend who doesn't watch a lot of movies. <laughs> that's that's well, the most well, objective well, yeah. look we can get. <laughs> We'll give some thought onto this in the future, I suppose. Yeah, we, we, we don't have to, obviously. <laughs> I doubt she'd like to do it anyway. All right, well, speaking of the future, we have... Oh, yes. <laughs> we have at it remade on Twitter. We have at they remade it on Instagram. We have they remade it at gmail.com. Send us things. Uh, I mean, it's an email thing, so it's not like gifts or money. Just send us thoughts on anything. I don't know. You can listen to us yeah, on most like any just... podcast platform, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Google Play, iTunes, Podbay, uh, Stitcher. That's the one I almost always forget, but I really shouldn't because it's so prominent. Um, it's our biggest one. Gotta love them. Y- y- oh yeah. You gotta love it. And uh, leave us a five-star review on any of them you th- that you like. Obviously iTunes helps the best, but it, whatever you like. Did I say five-star review? I mean, hey, I'm not going to say no I, to a five-star I five appreciate review. those more, so I, I appreciate those most of all, of course. I don't want to influence anything, though, for whatever. I, leave what you want. Leave what yeah. you want. You're your own yeah. person. Be genuine with us. We we like genuineness. Don't be all, you know, hoity-toity with your comments. Just be like, oh, okay, this is dumb, and we think you're dumb. It's like, thank you for the criticism. It's an asshole way to do it, but it's criticism nonetheless. <laughs> earnestness is important i would prefer that if you had a critique you gave an actual or if you didn't like it you gave an actual critique because then we could always get better that's important um and and also spell check because if you don't we will mock that incessantly i'm sure (laughs) oh yeah i'll have a whole segment on the show dedicated to reading i'll call it comment corner um but he said we he said we suck uh with only a c (laughs) ew c-u-c-k that's the wrong word too oh (laughs) I meant just like S U S U K C, but whatever. I know. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's it, though. Anything from you? Uh, no. Just kind of enjoy your evenings. The yada yada. I hope you get to see this movie sometime. I think it's fantastic. Oh yeah, watch both of these back to back at a drive-in, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, bring your significant other. Have a fun time, or not. Bring some popcorn. Also have some fun time. Bring your stepchild and try to get them to relate to you. I don't know. (laughs) Bring your boss, who you are also dating, and who wants to give up your lifely possessions in order to get famous or something. I don't know. (laughs) Ew. Don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, maybe not do that. I mean, don't do the stepkid thing either, honestly. Yeah, just go by yourself. Who cares? (laughs) Yeah, just, you're you're your own person. Be independent. Yeah, I saw Dumbo by myself, and I'm fine. Well, except for when all those idiots started clapping near the end. But uh, besides that, (laughs) <laughs> See movies on your own, it's fine. Yeah. So I guess I guess I'd say that's that, wouldn't you? Oh yes, definitely. So then, as always, I'm your mild mannered alien emissary Stuart. Um and I am Jacob. <laughs> I figured you I thought you're gonna go for like Gort or something, but whatever. I don't have I didn't prepare. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I gotta keep you on your feet, man. <laughs> but yes, okay. I'm your host Stuart. He's your host Jacob. Yada yada. Yeah. We love you. Have a good evening. Bye.
you must say these words. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Please repeat that. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. You must remember those words. <laughs> 